Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of Trash Talk on Flying Circus, first flight special, where I talk about the planes in the book. Four planes to go in this expansion, let's go, starting with the KZ-2 Mangustin for the worker. The military of the Kingdom of North Loring, never quite as prosperous as its southern neighbor, relied heavily on arms imports from the Machi republics. With priority going to the embattled UWF, they were finally forced to jumpstart their own aircraft industry, initially producing a quite respectable copy of the Ritter Model C, a mongoose to hunt the Gotha Cobras. That's when the trouble started, first, the order of Neustadt coursers which were to serve as the country's two-seat bombers were lost with the city's fall, procurement asked for a variation to be created, no issues. Then their promised Mitcher IGWA-84 photo observers ended up underwater with the factory in Durand, well, the two-seater could carry a camera. When surplus RATH and A9C were retasked by the UWF as balloon busters, extra rocket racks were added. To cut costs, the single-seater was cancelled, the fighter still had guns after all. Of course, its performance was now unacceptable on its original engine, and there was simply no chance of acquiring a Schreiber B.9, the only other option was the twin-row L.14 racing rotary. In the end, the plane was replaced by more modern designs before ever seeing combat. This plane, has two forward machine gun, a rear LMG turret, four massive bomb, four massive rockets, an external small recon camera to spy on people, and probably a cup holder too, it can basically do every single possible role you ever need in an airplane, terribly, because it's slow, sluggish, fragile, unreliable, and unstable as hell. And yet it's still better than quite a couple planes in a certain perspective, somehow, honestly the worst part isn't its stat, it's why the actual hell it has both bombs and rockets, how? How do you even use that, however you do it, you want to dumb those payload as fast as possible because otherwise your plane will be dragged down by gravity. There's no official variance of this thing, but I'm sure you can make changes to it just by removing stuff from the plane, however, I did try to do that to see if it could improve the plane and the result is, well, at this point, just get an actual dogfighter, at least it's somewhat affordable. So, KZ2 Mangustin, for people that wants a plane to do everything, while also have a reasonable amount of budget, I still suggest that you get something else, but if you want a peak stupid airplane, this is it. Next up, for the farmer, the rebuilt Landlike Mechonic Viper. Landlike Mechonic was a pre-war aeronautical hobby magazine which, in the build-up to the Great War, ran a roaring trade connecting small aircraft manufacturers with territorial defense forces in need of cheap kit planes, before long, they were getting in on the business themselves. Unsurprisingly, a magazine dedicated to home electrification and fanciful futurism drawings did not prove to be the best aircraft manufacturer. The LM Viper, a knockoff Cobra MA designed to be flat packed and shipped by airship, was the best of a bad lot, which meant it was merely mediocre. Of course, that was only if you managed to decipher its infamously unclear instructions. The conclusion in the aftermath was that the planes were likely more a scam than a working aircraft, and after struggling for months to piece them together, Many villages simply gave up, this made them a convenient source of parts for many an enterprising rural inventor willing to get creative with the instructions. Nobody is sure who built the first Canard Viper, but they caught on like wildfire, they flew little better than the original configuration, but they were undoubtedly far more interesting. It helped that the instructions were much easier to follow. Nobody was fooled when Landlike Mechonic tried to sell a proper kit of it. So, yes. The lore of the plane is literally someone just built a plane in reverse and it got better, and also we can't ever escape Star War reference in this book, ever. I won't call this plane fast, but it is very affordable and has quite a nice handling, while its engine isn't reliable and it's not exactly stable, it has one advantage that top it over all other farmer planes, it has two guns, both LMG however so you will be reloading frequently, but that's a lot of firepower for a farmer to start with. There's no variant of the Viper, but I'm sure someone could get real creative with the instruction again. Cheap, twin machine guns, and looking cool as hell, the rebuilt land-like mechanic Viper could probably save the day. For the third plane for this episode, there's the Libel T.87, for the believers, it's a fucking death trap. The Euler Republic knew it was living on borrowed time, carved out as neutral territory in the 1510 treaty that ended the first war between Gotha and Fokker, there was no doubt in the minds of the citizenry that one or both powers would one day come back for their errant colony. While Euler triumphed in their war with Sopwith, it wasn't enough to secure coastal trade routes, with this in mind, they began work on an aircraft they could build themselves. 
Lacking access to cutting-edge engines or the interrupter gear, they brought together the greatest minds in the country to make a miracle happen. The Libel T.87 was that miracle, the unique tandem wings and streamlined body were years ahead of their time, making the diminutive Scout far faster than it had any right to be. That speed came at a cost though, supports were omitted to reduce drag, which meant a hard turn in even the shallowest dive or with the slightest damage could be lethal to plane and pilot. In the end, the T.87 was brought low after a year of war not by the enemy, but by lack of petrol, the battered fleet was captured and sold off, but in recent years many have returned to their homeland in the hands of young Euler patriots. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. This thing is speed, this thing can turn, it can climb like hell too, and it's quite cheap with dual machine guns with all that stats, so what's the problem, well, this, you will die if you turn even slightly too hard compared to like, basically all other planes, you don't want to get shot in this thing either, at all if possible. When flying this plane, you want to use all of your possible advantages and finish the dogfight quickly, because otherwise you will be dead, fast. You are basically living through speed, more so than any other planes, do not get too slow or death will catch up to you, but thankfully, you are pretty damn fast to start with. This plane has no variant, presumably because the airframe is so fragile, any attempt to modify the plane will cause it to collapse. High speed, streamlined, and packed full of power like a bullet, the Libel T.87 unfortunately cannot turn hard, just like a bullet, take good care of it, and it will take care of you. Lastly, for the student, there's the Moss Z95 Phonics, tomorrow's plane, today. Saddled with the immense cost of rebuilding the last state on Earth, the Kingdom of Sopwith did not design any new military planes for nearly two decades after the war. They had no need to, the up-engined versions of their wartime stocks were more than enough against pirates and warlords. But when rumors reached the country that the disowned Sopwith Expeditionary Force had been seen working alongside Goth Army Group North in 1617, the kingdom began quiet preparations for what could be another war, old weapons were brought out of storage, agents were spread across the continent to fund resistance groups to the Goths and SEK, and in Sopwith's last great college, engineers work on the warplane of tomorrow. It was here, in the workshops of Carp at M University, that infamous designer Vera Moss began to rebuild her reputation. With the lessons learned from her ambitious if fatally flawed first design, she built something far more conventional, almost conservative, if you ignore everything revolutionary about it. The model which entered production is simplified from the original design, simpler, with a cheaper version of its futuristic radial engine and a scaled-back electrical system. It's not everything it could be, not yet, but the Z95 still represents the very cutting edge, with new planes rolling off the line every day, when the war against fascism comes, Vera Moss Firebird will be at the front lines. So, I think I once said that the Mark Grifzer Storer B is the most beautiful plane in flying circus, I'm taking that back, this is it, the Phonics is taking the throne now, look at its futuristic comfy glass canopy and its streamlined form, this is the queen, right here, and she's powerful. It's not just fast and tough, it also has a reliable engine that can breathe easily even at 5 kilometers above the ground, and an airframe that's highly stable without being too much, storing enough fuel to fly basically anywhere. Also, the glass canopy I mentioned, it means you are not getting blasted by air just from flying, so you are not stressed just flying this thing at all, and if you look forward a bit, you will notice that those don't look like normal machine guns. That's right, those are dual heat ray machine guns, capable of setting its target on fire, powered by an alternator and two windmills for effectively infinite shots, plus you are using illuminated reflex sight, the common World War II technology that actually existed since the 1900s that makes aiming in a plane far easier, and this thing is also plated with armor to protect against critical damage. It's fast, it's comfortable, it's lethal, and it looks goddamn beautiful, it's price tag, doesn't matter, you are getting its worth and beyond. Plus, the phonics isn't a lonely beauty, where the Jernsback Experiment 0012 is the most advanced experimental plane in flying circus, the Moss Z95 phonics is the most advanced mass-produced plane in flying circus. So this plane won't be flying alone, it will be flying with its entire squadron and beam spam fascists to death. Hell, this is not even Vera Moss's best work yet, and I'm now really looking forward to that. But, there is one problem, one single tiny problem you need to remember, the Moss Z95 phonics, is designed to work in tandem with other Moss Z95 phonics, let me explain, you see this, the phonics unfortunately has turned bleed too, 
but since it mostly works as an energy fighter in the truest sense of the word, it's fine, until it isn't. With the windmill, the phonics can get more power based on how fast it is, when it passed 20 speed, usually during or after diving, it can just rapid fire those heat rays with no problem and deal all the damage, above 10, it can still fire those heat rays without taking your hand off the trigger, but when it gets below speed 10, those guns are basically the most advanced paperweights in Himmelgard. If you get too slow in a phonics and you have no way to recover speed when an enemy is at your 6, I would suggest running, but that would be hard to do with no speed. The reason why I said this won't be a problem if there's another phonics in the squadron is that after a phonics burns off all its speed and power blasting something down, another phonics can take over while the other one climb up to recover its speed, and this process can be repeated until everything on the other side is gone. In a flying circus usually mixed with all kinds of planes, that's gonna be difficult, but not impossible to handle, to simply put, don't get too slow. There's no variant of this plane because how do you beat perfection, but it's probably because it's too brand new. Moss Z95 Phonics, currently the most advanced mass-produced scout of the post-war era, is probably the most lethal thing possible in the air thus far with a tiny teeny problem, well worth its price even with its issue. And that's all on these four airplanes, from the all-possible purpose KZ-2 Mangustin that really tried too hard with everything, the X-winged rebuilt land-like mechanic Viper that comes with good firepower in a cheap and agile airframe, the bullet-shaped Libel T.87 that unfortunately cannot turn well, exactly like a bullet, and the highly advanced Moss Z95 phonics that sits right at the edge of technological advancement and uses it to its fullness. So yeah, that's all on the first flights, a flying circus plane pack, and with all flying circus projects still in development phase, I will be putting the series on hiatus. It really has been a lot of fun talking about airplanes, more than I expected when I started the series. Anyway, hope you all enjoy all the current episodes so far, that's all for now, and I will see you all next time. Hello there, if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell button. If you really want to support my channel, you could visit my Patreon page, or buy me some Kofi, links in the description. Anyway, have a nice day.